Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. We've got three big topics today. We can talk about what do you look for when you're looking for a really good investment. Christoph, you're going to tell us about AI's impact on society. We've got an example from last year. And we'd also like to riff on Tesla's recent cut in the price of full self-driving. I think it could be interesting questions for shareholders and potential future shareholders there. Yes, but before we get to all that goodness, rumor has it that some bad, bad thing has happened to you. It's not world altering. It's just very, very annoying. Uh, my motorbike was stolen on Friday. Mm. The actual, the very last photo I have of the thing is me standing in front of it, recording one of my daily tweets. And that's so my bike is now going to be memorialized on Twitter, never to be seen again. Yeah, that's the first time I saw it. And I saw, oh man, she's a beaut, uh, a dark beauty, a black stallion. <laughs> uh, and now, and so it was stolen from in front of your driveway? Or No, I went, I've been playing quite a bit of tennis since I got back from the States. Uh, so I went to a somewhat dodgy part of, of East London to play tennis with a couple of friends. Park the bike. And actually, I'm so, this is the fourth bike I've had stolen over the last 25 years. I've probably owned 20 bikes. So kind of one in five uh, failure rate. And I was kind of skeptical about leaving it where I left it. It was like a nice like middle of the afternoon in a park. And I thought, oh, should I just ride into the park and I'll literally park it by the tennis court? I thought, oh, I don't need to disturb people with my loud ass motorbike. I'll just leave it on the street. It's like 50 meters away. And I came back to it 90 minutes later and uh, no longer there. How does how does that that happen? Uh, there's just a lot of motorcycle crime in the UK, unfortunately, in London in particular. Typically, it's professional thieves with a van. The van's been turned into a Faraday cage in case you've got a tracker, and like the bike was chained up. But uh, even so, you know they'll just angle grind the chain if they need to, or if not, and then just lift it into the bike. You know, two guys can lift a bike like that, and they're gone in thirty seconds. So, what are you going to use to move around now? bicycle i did take the bicycle down to play tennis the other day so yeah yeah crack open the bicycle uh got the new tesla coming soon the uh, the updated model 3 so i can't complain about that i'll replace the bike at some point i'm not in a hurry to replace it because frankly it was more of a toy than anything practical but uh it's just irritating do you think this might be in any way karma for how loud motorcycles are and disturbing the peace could that yeah, be that's definitely <laughs> that's definitely it obviously <laughs> they are uh they are i know you you grimaced when i told you i've got a loud bike they are appropriately loud because they let people know that you're coming up but about to filter past them and then they give you a little bit more room or they, at least they are more likely to notice okay. you over their blaring music so there is a good reason well major bummer that that's that's not great <clears throat> so be. it's a it's a bit of a shame because i've been recording my daily tweets and I'd planned the tweet I was going to put out on Saturday, and I was going to record it at the tennis courts, you know, post tennis with the bike. And so I got back, and there's uh, no bike and no tweet, unfortunately. So I had to do the tweet in the back garden. I think when I got home. Sad badger. Seeing a sad badger is the is in fact one of the saddest things on this planet. So I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm pretty chill. This is a uh, part and parcel of being a motorcycle rider in a city, unfortunately. Yeah, you do seem pretty, uh, you have a little frown, a little sad face, but no, you're not crying tears. Maybe you did that. It sounds like you didn't even cry tears after it happened. Just annoying. Yeah. I guess insurance will cover all of it, right? Uh, hopefully. We're processing the case right now. Yep. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, annoying indeed. Uh, shall we turn toward investing? Yes. And, you know, hopefully I saw, I saw the tweet I did send from the back garden in the end was, um, a two parter I'm sending the other part today, which is what do I look for in a good investment? And, um, and in that one tweet, I shared about nine or 10 factors out of a plethora of factors. We thought we would uh, dig into those on the next couple of podcast episodes and explore at least one of those topics. Um, and if if you're on the Twitters, let us know if you've if you want us to go deeper on a particular one of these over the next few weeks. But uh, the one we thought we'd riff on today is let me just read it from my tweet. I look for 
long-term trends and strategic alignment. Does the company align with powerful trends that are shaping the future? For example, NVIDIA underpinning many recent innovations in AI. What do you think about that as an investment criteria? If I were to summarize it, essentially, like companies that are selling products or services that the world needs more of in the future. In theory, it sounds lovely, especially when you can cherry pick an example like NVIDIA, because in hindsight, of course, it's true, right? That in, yeah. uh, so on, on one hand, I totally buy it. But as you were reading it, I immediately thought of a company like, say, Lululemon. Is that a case where, and by the way, Lululemon has done very, very well in terms of share price recently. And we were discussing it, I think, amongst ourselves. This is a company that seems to have incredible uh, staying power. Everyone here in Austin that I look around uh, is wearing Lululemon. Is this a company that has a powerful trend that is shaping the future in any way? Is, or is that not what we're talking about? That's not what I'm talking about, but I certainly, uh, if you're a fashion person or a you know sports apparel person, you might have a much more informed view on this. I'm talking about the companies that the world needs more of and that are making the world a better place and therefore um, aren't sort of transient things that will come and go. These are like significant changes for the coming, let's say, 10 years. I'll give you a different example um, beyond NVIDIA like robotic surgery, very clearly better patient outcomes, uh, standard of care. So I want to own the leader in that case, intuitive surgical. Yeah, I was going to rib a little bit on this idea that the world needs something because humanity is maybe getting a lot over its skis as far as I could tell. We'll talk about this with AI uh, in our next segment. But you're, you're implying that there's a kind of do-goodism in this category, right? The world needs, and you gave an example of AI, which I think might be complicated or is complicated in this moment. But then the second example was robotic surgery, I would agree is good, I guess, in a good, bad dichotomy. But then that limits what, that, this category to... It doesn't have to be ethically good. I'll give you a different example, like FinTech stuff, let's say, um ubiquitous, cheap um, foreign exchange, just because we talked about WISE and we have WISE on the podcast next week to tell us a lot more about that topic. Um, that's a service, I think, that directionally the world is heading towards. Like who wants to pay FX fees? Who wants to have to go and get cash to go into a store and buy like their Lululemon leggings or their next Tesla car or the replacement motorbike? would much rather do this stuff uh, electronically, it's safer, it's less grubby, it's more convenient, it's more traceable. Is that making the world a better place? Maybe a little bit. It's not saving lives, uh, but it's certainly a service that I think the world will need more of in the future. That's kind of my criteria. I think we need to take the ethical piece out of it entirely. Sure. This seems to be more about that the company is oriented toward f the future. It's a futuristic yeah. outlook. So in other words... A company like a supermarket company or say a gas and oil company, they're doing more of the same, right? They're not innovating. They're providing essential services that are needed now in a certain way. But that amusing sidebar, right? You know, it looked like Amazon was in that innovating, say, grocery shopping with their Amazon Go stores. And then it turns out uh, what they actually had was they'd offshored the cashier from like the local store to a massive team in India who are kind of doing overseeing the process and making sure people weren't swiping things or being double charged for things. So there was like an innovation that maybe was dressed up as being a bit more innovative than it really was. And now Amazon's walking that back. So give me an example of a company that fails this test for you. That fails the test. Yeah. That does not uh, align with a powerful trend shaping the future. Well, any legacy business, almost almost any business. I've, so I've mapped out uh, about 13 or 14 mega trends. So things like the ones we just talked about, health tech, things like space. Mm -hmm. And pretty much, pretty much all of my investments align to one or more of those mega trends. And then I suppose if I'm taking a very 
strong view, anything that sits outside those trends, I think is potentially doomed. That's obviously a bit false. But say a Lululemon yeah. doesn't align with those any of those trends. It's just retail, it's fashion. Maybe they, maybe they did something innovative with fabric or something, but essentially it's kind of branding. Mm-hmm. And at some point that will go out of fashion and maybe they reinvent themselves, maybe they don't. Oh, so interesting. So for example, a company that I have a strong conviction on, Celsius Holding, Celsius mm-hmm. the Energy Drink, that would be yeah. just another counterpart to the Lululemon example, right? They're not doing okay. anything future oriented. They're more about branding and riding the current wave. So that would not pass your test as an investment based on this criteria, correct? Exactly right. Exactly right. Which is why I don't own that company. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not a good investment. Right. It just means it doesn't fit my investment yeah. criteria because I'm looking and I do apply that ethical lens. Like I'm looking for stuff yeah. that makes the world a better place for good reasons because it helps me remain a shareholder if the going gets a bit tough. Yeah, that's right. So it's future oriented. And obviously, we put something like cybersecurity, which is your favorite trend into this bucket. Yep, totally. Um, NVIDIA is the example, AI, obviously, what are some other mega trends uh, that you could think of right now? Yeah, one of mine that I'm not sure, maybe it failed. But one of my mega trends I was tracking was uh, like flexible working, work from anywhere, remote working, Mm -hmm. because it seemed like post-pandemic, it seemed very strongly to me that we were going to remain, at least in the sort of developed world, like in North America, Europe, in the big cities, most people will continue to work from home. And so I, that's why I invested in companies like Airbnb, like flexibility, go and go live somewhere fun and do your job from that fun location. And I invested in companies like Zoom um, and, and other enabling technologies for that changing work, changing sort of work habit. And maybe that didn't play out. Maybe actually that's been largely walked back. So I'm not always right, but I try and look for things that I th- that feel self-evident. And then sometimes I'm wrong. And I guess that's the flip side to this category. The future is by definition unknown. And it's shocking how many times humans have made prog- prognostications in one direction that turn out to be completely other. So... Yeah. Uh, But, you know, I think it it seems like one thing this category, this uh, rubric has going for it is that the stock market is future oriented. It prices equities based on the potential future cash flows, not the success of the company in the past, which is an interesting thing to really consider that it doesn't matter how great, say, Apple computer was in the past. If the market thinks nobody will want iPhones two years from now, the stock price will crater. So having an eye to these future trends is absolutely important and also somewhat unknowable. When I think about my investments, I'm thinking about the future and I'm thinking about mostly technology and its impact on society. And I find that quite a fun topic to cogitate on. Scary sometimes, but also very exciting. Right. You've recently been doing nothing but reading Dune novels all morning and night, right? And watching the films. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to question this motorcycle narrative. Here. This is all very consistent for me. Like technology equals good. I, I love that bike. And my last three bikes have been the same bike, a BMW S1000R. I love that bike because it was so loaded with technology and clever gadgetry to stop you wheeling too hard or, uh, you know, wanting being able to break in the corner. Like normal non-tech motorcycles can't do these things. Okay, technology equals good, says Luke. I'm not going to drop any Heidegger on you today. <laughs> I'm going to get back to that topic in a future yeah. episode. Speaking of, this weekend I watched a clip on the Jon Stewart Daily Show John Stewart, for our international listeners or anyone might not know, is a political pundit in the U.S. He's a comedian first and foremost, and he usually uh, likes ribbing on the media itself. So he offers some meta commentary about how this, uh, the system works. And he was doing a deeper dive on current news media focus on how great AI is. So AI, and you see a bunch of talking heads from Microsoft and OpenAI. AI is going to solve all the problems in the world. And then eventually you get to some talking heads, CEO of a company that said, quote, AI is brutal 
if you think like as a human. And that's the that's the soundbite that John Stewart was having a, a fun with, but also a problem with. It seems like AI is already underway and already having Im- immense impact on the lives of companies and workers. So when a company does indeed fire 90% of its staff, the human cost is significant and non-theoretical, right? And it seems like we're at the beginning stages of this. What I'm saying is from the investment perspective, things are rarely pure and all good. There's always complexity involved. And right now we are, I think, clearly in an AI, rah-rah, high valuation potential bubble. I'm not going to outright and say, say this is a bubble because bubbles are empty and they pop because there's nothing substantial underneath. I don't think that's the case with AI, but I'm bringing in the social commentary to suggest that as investors, when significant amount of humans are losing their jobs, there's going to be pushback, either politically, culturally, socially, some combination thereof. In the United States, there's an election year. And before we get something like universal basic income, which is a a highly, highly complicated uh, story that, that isn't anywhere near fruition, I suggest caution is warranted in all AI investments based on the blowback that's happening. So let me make a case for why this is net positive. And I think this is actually not a great example because this is a somewhat smaller e-commerce company called Dukan. It's kind of like like a mini Shopify, I think. Um, and they he claimed that he was planning to exit 90% of their customer service staff. Um, but I think a more, possibly more credible example of the same thing was maybe Klarna. I think they issued a press release, a bit more formal than like a throwaway comment from the CEO, that their own chatbot had was being used for like some significant percentage of customer service cases. Now this is this is obviously net negative for the employees in customer support, who in this case are, you know, one or two thousand individuals who may or may not be able to redeploy into an alternate job or upskill into a similar job. At a, you know, for example, to upskill. So you're no longer like the first line person that gets called for customer support you're like the escalation point for a really complex case that requires humans to dive in and do something, you know, get, get into systems and do something difficult. M- my conjecture, his, his, this is one example, right? But you could apply this to any innovation. This is just innovation that makes the world a better place. Because I freaking hate sitting on hold for half an hour to talk to a customer service agent who doesn't have the information at their disposal and I get bounced around five different people and I have to start from scratch every single time. Like, it's just frustrating, right? And so if we can put better tools so I can call and within one second, my call is answered, or ideally, I don't even have to phone. I just talk to the AI via a chatbot, like online. Um, and I can get 90 something percent of my questions or problems resolved without having to deal with a human. Bingo. And that's helped like hundreds of thousands of people who are customers of that company. And even if it only saves me, I don't know, 10 minutes once a week, that's pretty significant saving. This is why I think it's necessary to bring in a little bit of philosophy here. I don't disagree with anything you said, but let me follow up with another quote from this clip on The Daily Show. I think uh, Stuart said something like, AI models have hoovered up the entire sum of the human experience we've accomplished over thousands of years. And now we just hand it off to be their prompt engineers, meaning humanity has looked and functioned a certain way for a very, very long time. And all of a sudden in, in this blip of, of time, so much progress, if you want to put it in quotes, if you want to be a little skeptical, progress is happening. The customer experience is getting better, so on and so forth. But at what cost, I think, is Stuart's invitation to consider. And if we're exchanging ease and consumer 
satisfaction for livelihoods and the security and meaning that comes from having a job. In other words, customer efficiency versus jobless rates, then you're making progress on one end, but not on the other. I think I'm seeing this from multiple angles. And my takeaway really is before we get carried away with technological progress as a kind of utopian, business-friendly, customer-centric force, we have to also simultaneously see that it can't be a straight, it's not going to be a straight ramp, on-ramp, and that probably revolutionary type forces will be invoked when enough people lose their jobs and the only ones that get to benefit in a sense from better products and efficiency are those that are wealthy enough and have security already. But that's the minority of people. So you're, you're forecasting like the next say, uh, French Revolution uh, where the aristocrats are beheaded. This is kind of the, 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 the latter-day analogy. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some truth to that, that usually amongst major shifts where in, enough people are, are, are in a position of insecurity, let's put it that way, most, the most maybe non-aggressive way of, of putting it, then it doesn't matter how good the technology is, there's going to be a lot of blowback and regulatory politicizing and fighting. And maybe I'm putting forth this idea. Let's just imagine where enough of this force and pressure builds up where now people start going on strikes against some, you know, whatever, AI companies or AI initiatives. All it would take is some purchase in some of these arguments and some kind of uh, speed bump along AI's growth journey for companies that are so richly valued that are entirely AI-centric that those companies as investments might suffer pretty dramatic drawdowns because it'll be turbulent. I mean, I don't know if it's French Revolution style with guillotines, right? But uh, when we're talking about people's livelihoods, that's an area of life where there's not a lot of joking around usually. The one bit I did find compelling about uh, Stuart's arguments was this is like we've always had innovation, you know, as we agriculture to, you know, proper farming equipment, you know, people were put out of jobs. But the pace of this inflection point that's upon us, it's going to happen. It's happening right now and it's happening so fast that regulation can't keep up right. um, and society can't adapt quick enough. Uh, And I think that that's definitely something for us to be thoughtful about. Yeah. And you know, the example you gave of a call center and its inefficiencies, I'm with you, brother, brother Badger, the torment for me is being on the phone, lost in the endless maze of, of call centers. From a personal standpoint, I want all those things gone. Just make the AI robot do the thing, right? But if a call center has, you know, a thousand people, those thousand people get fired and now they need a job. But obviously the, the kinds of jobs available that are the non-skill jobs will become increasingly scarce rather than more plentiful. So where are all those extra people going to go? Yeah, it's, you're right. It's a difficult question. Right. And that the base of that is yeah. only going to accelerate. So it's... Universal basic income, right? It seems to me like the, the inevitable path we, we need to get to, but how quickly we'll get there is unknown. And that there is going to be some turmoil in between society realizing the, the economic benefits of these tools at incredible scale, like starting to take trillions and trillions of dollars of friction out of commerce and then be able to funnel that into think, initiatives like universal basic income or creating different types of more creative human jobs that aren't perhaps about like factory work and production line work and call center work. Maybe they're things that are 
sort of valuable for their intrinsic cultural benefits. That's probably the direction we go as a society. Right. So caution around AI, I think, is warranted because the forces involved are not purely business and they're not purely technological. We're human beings still. I mean, we're, we're cyborgs to many extents with our addictions to iPhones and technology, sure. But speaking of emergent trends, you know, if your portfolio is entirely AI centric, I would, I would just put in your thinking caps what kinds of uh, revolutionary historical forces might also be in the works. It pretty depends on your optimism or pessimism about the future. This is a total sidebar. I saw a tweet I think a few days ago, and it was like, click one of these buttons. You can either go 50 years into the past, you can transport yourself 50 years into the future, or you can have $100 million today. And virtually everybody was either going into the past or taking the money. And I was thinking, like, I want to go into the future. <laughs> why, is, why, is, why isn't everybody want to go into the future? I want to, you know, live forever with 50 year time technology. What, like, how am I such a, how am I so isolated with this opinion? Uh, you're a futurist, right? Uh, optimist, right? You're an optimist. So you want to see how quickly the progress is being made and all the fun toys, right? <laughs> you're like a kid in the candy store with... <laughs> it, just me, it just shocked me. Like nobody in the comments, and there were hundreds of them, was voting for the future. I was literally, I felt marginalized with my opinion. <laughs> Everyone figures they're going to end up, like they're transporting to the future and they're in some like that being uh, used by the matrix and like having their energy drained or something right well yeah be be careful of what you wish for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so speaking of the future the there are fewer more innovative companies on the planet than uh tesla what's the latest with them badger oh yeah yeah that's right sorry that, that third topic so um Tesla have just announced, I believe, in the last week or so, they're cutting the price of full self-driving in North America um, from $199 to $99 um, a month. And so if you want to have FSD in the States today, keep me honest on this, I think you either pay a one-off fee of what's currently $12,000, and they've played with that pricing, it's gone up. I think if it was $15,000 for a period, it's back down to about $12,000, or you can subscribe month by month. It used to be 200 bucks a month, now it's 100 bucks a month. And I think there's some interesting questions this opens about the company and also about its future. But what's your immediate reaction to that? You're already an FSD owner. Do you feel like that's been devalued by that price cut? No, I, I could see, I think generally I interpret it in a positive light. They're clearly the lead, they need more data, more exposure and now that the product is incredibly impressive to anybody that has not used it it will turn heads what i but but it also comes with a whole lot of unknowns for me i just don't i think it's too complicated a moment that we don't know how quickly this could actually become implemented in reverse tesla's financial trajectory which has been slowing and uh, demand seemingly has been dropping and there's a lot of macro headwinds and all that. So the, the, uh, Elon Musk for me cuts both ways. I've always since following his story, this story for a long time now, I really applaud his incredible visionary ruthlessness. And it's also true that he really, part of his strategy is over promising relentlessly enough of the time he actually gets it done eventually but some of the time the over promising is kind of like i think your favorite to favorite uh whipping boy arc invest in zoom and their projection of <laughs> zoom taking over the world and share price that's sometimes how elon comes across to me also so with regard to fsd robo taxis the event on august 8th I have no idea truly what to expect and how I'm going to parse reality from vision. No idea. I like, I like that more data will come in. So I'll give it that. It's worth thinking about the motivations 
for why they've done this. Like they could just be, here's a couple of ideas off the top of my head. They could just be playing with pricing to try and see what people's price sensitivity is to this and whether this, you know, the extent to which this captures more users. They could be trying to drive people to use FSD more because don't forget, they just had a one month giveaway where everybody had FSD. If you had a Tesla, I believe, or if you had the right level of hardware, you were given FSD for free for a month to try it out. So this could be them seeing, oh, wow, we got a ton of data from that one month. Let's try and capture even more data, as you say, as a lead into the autopilot event. It could just be like, we need more money to reinforce the balance sheet because um, we're in trouble. Like we need to juice the top line because well, our margins are compressing and we're actually not looking very pretty right now compared to legacy auto. Or it could be regulatory. Like if you give enough people mm. some new gizmo, some new toy, mm -hmm. it's actually much harder for regulators to take that thing away because you'll have far more people saying, oh, I want my, mm. I'm paying for this thing, I want my robo car back. Um, maybe they maybe they feel well probably two parts this right because they've just rolled out fsd 12.3 which you gave me a demo of in austin which is, it's it's imp very impressive certainly compared to what's in the uk but i gather impressive compared to previous iterations of fsd so maybe tesla i mean almost certainly they now feel this is almost prime time with the technology even though it could still be a light year from where it needs to get to to be fully autonomous like robo taxi i think is going to be Vaporware, personally, we'll wait and see. Um, but it's it's unarguably better than version 11 and the stuff before that. And so maybe it's good enough now that they're, because remember the beat, it was like a closed beta. You had to be like a super safe driver. You couldn't drive at night, all these crazy things to qualify, to even be allowed to use this stuff. And now they've made it accessible to everybody and they're cutting the price because they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to sell it to everybody. So it must be good enough that your average Joe idiot behind the wheel of a Tesla is probably going to be net safer with FSD than without, you'd hope, because they're trying to push the stats in that direction. Um, yeah, and then part of it could be that regulatory thing. Uh, the more people that have it, the harder it is for regulators to pull it away. I've been on this journey since the start. I was one of those first people to get the, get the first version, and I saw how... <laughs> Oh, yeah, how far from reality it was, even though it was kind of shocking that the car was driving itself. So this move increasingly makes it clear to me that t the future of Tesla as a investable company really, really does depend on the success and failure of FSD. And it's clear that Musk is sen sending signals to everyone that there he wants everyone's eyes on the robo taxi project and making this a reality if he does obviously uh, i think tesla's share price is worth multiples higher than it is now but how soon can this happen is this you know just because we're having the event on august 8th which is what four months away Remember when the Cybertruck release happened? That was like years and years. So yeah. as an investment, uh, I'm holding my Tesla shares right now with very, very cautious hands. Yeah, I've certainly, as an investment, I've, I've flipped from being a massive uh, Tesla and Musk bull to really not liking Musk to the point that I was selling off stock because the risk felt too high. And now in the last year or two, I've pivoted back to thinking, this is investable, uh, irrespective of his strange behaviors. Um, with great power comes great responsibility, and he doesn't seem to be conducting himself with that responsibility. But I'm, I, I don't know, I've got a 4% position, I think, something like that ballpark in my portfolio that feels broadly aligned with my conviction level. Yeah, so we talked about a lot of stuff this episode where maybe the, uh, you know, the takeaway is the future is not just coming, it's already here, but boy, does it come with a lot of pros and cons and gray areas and what have yous. Anywhere we look, right, things are fragile. Like a quote in my favorite, one of my favorite authors, William Gibson, I think he said years ago, a uh, very prescient comment, the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. Mm -hmm. So if you're the, uh, mm -hmm. if you're one of the aristocrats in this modern France 
um, the, the uneven distribution of technology and advancements to you, perhaps at the expense of everybody else, might result in a beheading. Badger, I want, I'd like to close this episode with a request of our audience. We've mm-hmm. been, we've been trying to grow our still, uh, still young YouTube channel. And it turns out that the back channel SEO stuff, there's things that the algorithms look, look for and leaving a review or saying something, I think in the comment section on YouTube helps a lot. Correct. I think we're putting out good content. And if you agree, if you're listening to this show and you haven't yet subscribed on YouTube or gone to Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts and given us a review and ideally subscribed as well, then you're doing us a disservice because we're still pretty subscale. And I think in aggregate, we've probably got less than a thousand people that listen to us. And surely these insights are worth more than a thousand people's worth of their time. So tell a friend, leave us a review, hit that subscribe. It will really help and it will encourage us to carry on. Right. That's right. You hear these requests, I think, from all podcasts, you know, click the like button, leave us a review. But we generally in this moment are asking for what, two minutes, uh, two, three minutes of your time to pause right here, go on the web platform and say a couple of sentences about why you enjoy our banter uh, some feedback for how Badger could improve his game so that we get even better. And uh, it'll help us out a lot. Yeah. And if you want to bitch and moan at us, then find us on Twitter uh, and tell us there. Like, we're very receptive to constructive feedback. Just don't be a troll. I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. Also, find us on WallStreetWildlife.com where we have a shiny. PDF uh, for your pleasure and edification about the 10 rules of the investing jungle. So if you haven't visited that, please do so. Very good, Christoph. Until another week, uh, be careful. It's a jungle out there. Your journey starts here. <laughs> okay. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.